Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. In last couple of lectures with Dr. Mani, you have learnt about different ways of data normalization as well as different type of statistical test employed to look at the data and how to obtain the meaningful information by comparing your controls and treatment and when you can employ the right type of test. Therefore, you have lot of data from the OMX experiments, but you cannot obtain the meaningful information until unless you are able to look for the right type of test and know that exactly how you are comparing your data. In this light, the machine learning tools can be very helpful. Today Dr. Mani is going to talk to you about machine learning and its application. He will also discuss about clustering. So, in context of machine learning algorithms, it will be very interesting to note how you can use many of the tests, many of the assays which you want to do in much more high throughput manner using machine learning. You will also learn different applications of supervised as well as unsupervised learning. Dr. Mani will then talk about different type of clustering such as hierarchical clustering, k-means clustering, fuzzy clustering and consensus clustering and so on. He will also provide you uh, a brief idea about the applications, various type of cluster visualization and principal component analysis. Further he will talk about the differences between classification and regression and then he will talk about random forest and classification tree and how both of them differ in terms of the overfitting of data. Finally, Dr. Bunny will talk about how machine learning can help in omics data analysis and right type of biomarker selection. After this brief introduction about today's lecture and different type of test which Dr. Bunny is going to explain, let us welcome Dr. Bunny for his today's lecture. So, the next topic that I am going to quickly cover machine learning. So, machine learning is uh, a sort of an outre, uh, outshoot of research in artificial intelligence. So, in the 60s people started uh, trying to build computers that behave like humans. So, and the area was called artificial intelligence and one of the signs of intelligence is that you can learn. And so, uh, getting computers to learn was part of the endeavor to make them intelligent and so machine learning is like a um, uh, area of artificial intelligence. <coughs> the, the, uh, the kind of disconcerting thing though is that you think something is if, if a machine did that, that would be considered intelligent and then the machine does it and then you say oh no that is not quite it, it should it did not behave intelligently. So, I think playing chess was one of those, you people would say if a computer could beat a human in chess then the computer would be considered intelligent. The computer beat the world chess champion in chess and then people said ah, well ok, it was just an algorithm that was only for chess, it is not really intelligent. So, I think the, it, the goal keeps shifting, but at least the research has provided a lot of tools that, that are uh, currently in uh, use are becoming increasingly useful. So, what are the applications and I have some quick applications. So, this churn prediction was something that I worked on in my previous life when I was working for the phone company. So, what you do is you look at customers calling patterns, their when they pay their bill, a lot of details about the customers, this is like cell phone service and then you predict who is going to leave the company in the next 2 or 3 months. And then you go and make them special offers or give them a free phone or whatever to get them to stay. So, that is what I was doing before I started doing cancer research. The other thing that is commonly encountered by people is credit card fraud. So, if I come, so last time I came to India, my wife wanted to buy some saris I, and I did not have enough cash. So, I took out my US credit card and handed it to the store clerk and the card was denied. Why? Because I live in the US, they know that and there is a charge coming from India because they know the source of the charge. So, that is very highly unlikely. So, it will be denied and even in the US, if you make a small charge on a petrol pump, like you, you charge like 1 dollar on the petrol pump and then you go to an electronic store and try to buy a TV, it will be denied. Because that has been the, the machine learning algorithms 
have kind of decoded that that is the pattern that people use when they have a stolen credit card. Because in a gas station in the US, it's unattended. There's no person uh, 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 filling your gas. You go to a machine, you put your card, and then you try to fill it. If it doesn't work, then you just drive away. If it works, then you really don't need gas, so you take the credit card and go and try and buy an expensive thing. So they have recognized that pattern and uh, using machine learning, and they will stop the transaction if that happens. So these are kind of like interesting applications of machine learning. The, if you have used Netflix, you will get recommendations for movies. So Netflix had a, a competition called the Netflix Prize. If you could predict who would like a movie better than what they were doing with some percentage, you would get a million dollars as a prize. So there was a group that got a million dollar prize and the paper is published to it. It's called the Netflix million dollar uh, competition. You can take a look at the paper if you're interested. This one, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll mention it. I think these are cool applications of uh, machine learning. So Target is a supermarket in the US. They sell all kinds of stuff. So they sell uh, soaps, shampoos, uh, cribs, uh, diapers for babies, you can buy electronics, you can buy a bike. It's like a superstore where you can buy pretty much anything. So they started a data mining program because they realized that when a woman becomes pregnant, they start shopping in a specific place, and then when they have their baby, they buy a lot of stuff in the same place. They usually don't go to a different place to buy things after they have their baby. So they figured, if we can get the women to come here before they become, before they deliver, so as soon as they become pregnant, if we give them an offer so that they can come to our store and start shopping here, then once they have the baby, they can, they'll keep coming here and they're very profitable. So they uh, hired a few statisticians and said, this is all the data, figure out who are pregnant women. So we can send them a, a discount mailer to get them to come into the store. So that's kind of the power of machine learning. And I guess the misuse of machine learning, you, you, you can look at it either way. So yeah, if you look at the model that was done for the pregnancy prediction and see what are the factors that uh, predict when a woman is pregnant, it was simple things like they buy shampoo that is not uh, scented, they buy a specific type of cream for their body, so there were like very few things like that, that predicted when a woman is pregnant. So all you had to do was capture all their transactions so that you knew what they were buying. And when they switch from a scented shampoo to an unscented shampoo and they start buying this kind of different cream, then you, it's very highly likely they are pregnant. So there are a lot of other applications and uh, of late you might have, say, so most of your phones have machine learning based uh, voice recognition. So previously, like five years ago, when I gave a command to my phone, it wouldn't recognize anything because of my accent. Now, it's fine. That's because um, the natural language processing using these newer techniques called deep learning has made the voice, the, the, the speech recognition so robust that it now uh, doesn't care about accent. It can uh, read through accents. There's also self-driving cars. So uh, in the US, there is a car company called Tesla that has a car that basically is an autopilot mode. You put it in that mode, it will, if there is a lane marking on the road, it will follow the lane and make sure it keeps enough distance from the car in front of it and just keep going. You don't need to do anything. So there was a recent, two days ago, there was an article in the newspaper where the police saw that there was this car, Tesla, going on the highway and they noticed that the driver was like half asleep on the steering wheel. And so they, they looked a little closer and it looked like he was drunk and he was asleep at the wheel. And the car was still going. So they knew it was a Tesla on autopilot, so what they did was they overtook the car, went in front, and slowly started slowing down. And this car slows down because it's maintaining a distance from the car in the front. And the car's, police car stopped, this car stopped, they went and woke up the guy and gave him a ticket. So. <laughs> So those are all like cool applications that we can talk about, but the main thing we want to do is apply machine learning to what we are doing, which is cancer research. So um, machine learning comes in, so there are a lot of variants, but I'll kind of simplify this a little bit. So there's this thing called unsupervised learning, where you try to use machine learning to discover things in the data. So it's called class discovery. 
where you want to automatically find hidden structure. So you have breast cancer samples. What are the innate groups in breast cancer? So you, can, you want to try to find the classes or the structure in breast cancer or any data using machine learning. So that part is called unsupervised learning. The other part is called supervised learning, where this is class prediction. So you, you, you have seen examples of some type. So you have examples of people having cancer, and then you know their uh, genome profile. You have examples of people who are normal, who don't have cancer. You have seen their genome profile. So looking at the profiles and the fact that you know they have cancer or not, can you predict when a new genome profile is given, whether that is from a cancer patient or a normal patient? So there, that is called class prediction. So there you are trained using uh, known classes, and then you want to make a prediction on, a, on the class when you get new data. So this is, um, you, you learn using what is called training data. Here you basically just look at data and try to find similarities in the data automatically. So this is like a cartoon from a paper that kind of describes it. I, I won't go into that, but uh, so, uh, some examples of unsupervised learning. So clustering is a really classic example of unsupervised learning. So you want to run clustering, you get some clusters, and you hope that those clusters have some biological meaning. So that is clustering. Uh, the other thing many of you might be familiar with is called principal component analysis, or PCA. So if you do PCA, if there are natural groups in your data, it will show you. So one thing you can do is you can do PCA, and then color your samples by the batch. If the one batch and the other batch completely separate in PCA, you have a batch effect that you need to address. Uh, but if they're all mingled together, you don't have a batch effect. Then you can color by some other information you want to see, whether is naturally uh, available in the data or not. So like subtype or cancer subtype or cancer versus normal, things like those that have very strong markers will, sh will result in separating those samples in PCA. So PCA is, even though it's unsupervised, many times you uh, mark the labels using other knowledge to kind of visualize the data. So PCA is an unsupervised method where you primarily use it to visualize data. And I can ignore the rest. So supervised learning is where you look at training examples and then you try to learn. So you're shown an image and you say, this is an image of a cat. You're shown another image, you say it's an image of a dog. So you see millions of these images with labels of cat and dog. And then if you get another new image, can you say whether it's a cat or a dog? So that's like a supervised learning algorithm. So here, there are a lot of algorithms you can use. And there is another distinction between regression and classification. So if you have to predict a continuous value, so how long are you going to live after you're diagnosed with cancer? So that's a prediction. Survival prediction is a continuous prediction. So that would be regression. But if it is grouping, so which group do you fall into? Do you fall into like the uh, basal cancer or uh, luminal breast cancer? So that would be classification. So unsupervised learning I mentioned is uh, primarily clustering, PCA, techniques like that. <clears throat> In clustering, the goal is to, you are given a set of items. So your samples or your images or speech from a set of people. And you want to group similar things together. So you somehow have to mathematically define what similar is, and then things that are similar you group together to form a cluster. And so items are basically data points. So they have a listing of what they could be. They could be clinical data when you're looking at samples. They could be genes or proteins. So which genes are similarly changing across all your patients? that you can cluster genes by similarity, you can cluster proteins by similarity. So you, a, any a data point can be an item. And similarity is usually measured using a distance, distance metric. So I'll, I'll, I think I have a few examples, but basically what you do is you can do your Pearson correlation or any kind of correlation is, is, is a similarity metric. There are um, other, uh, like, like Euclidean distance is a similarity metric in geometric space, for example. If in 2D or 3D, it's easy to visualize. You have some points scattered around, which are your closest points. And there you're using Euclidean distance. So there are many different metrics for measuring similarity. And when you want to do clustering, which metric you pick would depend on the kind of data you have and what you want to accomplish with the clustering. 
And the big question in uh, clustering that is that for that for which there is still no definitive answer is how many groups are there. So many times when you run clustering you have to say I want 5 clusters and then it will come up with group of 5 uh, things that are all similar. But you said 5, how many are there naturally in my data? So I have 100 breast cancer samples, are there only 5 PAM50 subtypes or are there 7 or is there only 2? How do I find the natural number of groups in my data? So that is a much more complex problem. There are some solutions to it but nothing is ideal, you have to try a lot of it before you can figure out what is happening. So this is another thing for which you uh, need to hire somebody like me. So it is all job security I think, that is why people do not. Uh... So hierarchical clustering is one, so when you are uh, measuring things that are similar you can do it in two ways. You can say I have all my samples, for each sample I am going to look at everything and then find the things that are closest and then keep merging things that are close together. So that is called bottom up or agglomerative clustering. The other one is you look at all your samples and say I want to divide based on similarity. So you start with everything and you start dividing your set of samples. So that is top down clustering. So hierarchical clustering is agglomerative. So it starts with all your samples, it measures distances between all pairs of samples and then starts grouping things that are uh, similar together. And you usually get like a dendrogram uh, that shows which samples are similar and how far apart they are. Many times hierarchical clustering is used to kind of group samples and genes when you are uh, visualizing data using a heat map. Uh, K-means clustering basically starts with everything and tries to find for a given um, a group it tries to find things that are close by and then it keeps iterating the process till the whole uh, clustering has stabilized and then you find some number of clusters. Um, usually in most clustering algorithms a point either belongs to a cluster or not. So the uh, membership in a cluster is uh, mutually exclusive. If you are a member of cluster 1, you can be a member of cluster 2 also because you take that point and put it in the cluster. Many times you may not want to do that, especially if you have many similar things and you are not sure where it falls uh, in uh, a point falls into, you might want to do fuzzy clustering where you say my point belongs to cluster 1 with probability 0.7 and it belongs to cluster 2 with probability 0.1 and to cluster 3 with probability 0.2. So it will all add up to a probability of 1 but it will give you the proportion that uh, the algorithm thinks that a, point, a, a sample falls into a, each of the clusters. So fuzzy clustering might, so it might so happen that you have 3 groups in your, uh, in your samples but then there are some samples that are like uh, do not belong at all. So when you do clustering the, by the nature of the algorithm it will force fit those samples into one of the groups which may not be the right thing to do. So in those cases what you would do with fuzzy clustering is you would get low probabilities for all 3 clusters or approximately similar probability for all 3 clusters and then you would say I do not know where to place this point so I am going to remove those. So if you remove those then you will have very clean clusters and then you can go and try to biologically determine what each of the clusters are without the other samples adding to the noise of the biological analysis. So in some situations it may be useful to do fuzzy clustering. Um, so, in determining how many clusters one of the things people do is to check how stable a clustering is. So let us say you some come up with some clustering, you perturb the data in some way, you remove a couple of samples or you repeat a couple of samples and then you redo the clustering, how different is the clustering. So you re redo this a thousand times and then you measure how many times do a pair of points always fall into the same cluster. So that is called cluster stability. And there is a method called consensus clustering that kind of uses this to come up with the correct number of clusters to look at. So what it does is you start with number of clusters predefined, you start with 2 clusters, 3 clusters, 4 clusters and so on. For each number of clusters that you have specified you go and redo the clustering a thousand times and you create what is called a, a consensus matrix. So this is a, these are samples. These are also the same samples in the same order and what this is saying is if I take this first sample here, how many times does it fall in the same cluster as this other sample? So if the number, the proportion is high then you have a darker blue dot, 
If the proportion is low, then you have a lighter blue dot. And if they never occur together, you have white. So for an ideal clustering, you want a, uh, a solid set of blocks that span the diagonal. So that is saying that the clustering is very stable. Things that are together are always together. So if you look at this, this is from the breast, breast cancer paper. This is with three clusters, four, five, and six. So you can see the cleanest consensus matrix is for when you have three clusters. So that's why we decided the proteomics data shows three clusters in the breast cancer data. So with consensus clustering, there are uh, more metrics you can calculate to kind of formally determine how many clusters you have. So you do clustering from two to 10 clusters. And then there are other metrics you can calculate to figure out what is the optimal number of clusters other than just like uh, visually looking at the consensus matrix. So recently, Karsten and I were trying to figure out an automated algorithm to find out the right number of clusters. And Karsten found a paper where they have 32 metrics they calculate, and they show you all those metrics. And in 100% of the time, uh, half of those metrics don't agree. So uh, half the metrics will say, I don't know, some percentage will say two clusters, some will say four clusters, and there's no way to decide. So even if you calculate a lot of metrics, it's not clear what the correct number of clusters are. And so many times you would have to do it visually, or you do it visually, and then you see if it makes biological sense by doing pathway analysis of which, patch, which pathways are enriched in cluster one, which are enriched in cluster two and three, and you map this to information you know about cluster sub of uh, cancer subtypes and say, okay, this seems to make more sense. So in other words, assigning number of clusters is more of an art than a science, even though there are some uh, uh, statistical tools available. So for clustering also, you would need like uh, tens of samples to do any clustering. Otherwise, you would basically be looking at uh, very uh, clusters that are not very robust. So you do clustering only when you are doing like a relatively larger study. If you have like 10 samples where you are looking at some IP or something like that, you wouldn't do any clustering. But in a discovery study, usually, where you have tens to hundreds of samples, you would definitely look at something like this. So if you look at proteogenomics papers, pretty much all of them have like close to 100 or more samples, and all of them do clustering. Even if you look at like uh, uh, genomics and uh, uh, kind of RNA papers that came out 15, 20 years ago, I think the, uh, the first paper that applied uh, hierarchical clustering to Affymetrix microarray data, I think in 97 or 98, I think had like 30 or 35 samples. So you need at least that many to have a reasonable clustering. When, when you get cl uh, clustering, you don't know what they are. You just, the, the algorithm, see the algorithm doesn't look at what the types are, it just looks at the proteomics data, nothing else. And it says based on the similarity of the proteomics data, I think these things fall together and there are three groups. It's up to you to go and look at those samples and say, are they basal samples? Are they luminal samples? What kind of samples are they? So that is a post-clustering analysis that you have to do on your own. So in the paper, we looked at it and we did a pathway analysis and this and that. And we tried to say that one was a basal-like cluster, other had mostly luminal samples. And the third one was, I think we called it a stroma-enriched cluster where there was more of a stromal signature in the samples. So all those are analysis you do after the clustering is done. During clustering, the algorithm doesn't know about any of that. So I think there have been newer studies where the consensus matrix says three, I think. But when we look at six clusters, it's more biologically informative. That is possible. So again, like I said, this is more black art than uh, strong science. So. Principal component analysis, I, I briefly mentioned, it's primarily a visual visualization mechanism people use to uh, look at data and the, the, the analysis is done without looking at any uh, labels or, or groups. But then once the uh, uh, PCA has been done, you color your samples using groups or whatever to see how the separation is. So it's more a visualization mechanism. So here's a really good example of how PCA uh, um, can, can help in visualizing things. So this is uh, P PCA visualization of uh, about 1,400 people. We are looking at the genotype of that many people. And for each person, they have measured approximately 200,000 uh, genomic loci. So they have characterized the loci for 
uh, that many uh, locations for about 1400 people and then uh, they have done PCA. So the original number of dimensions is the number of measurements you made and so that is about 200,000 and that is now collapsed into two dimensions. So when you do PCA you get these principal components which are uh, a, a kind of uh, uh, dimensions in which there is maximum change in your data. So the first principal component is the dim dimension in which there is maximum variation. The second one is the second most variation and so forth. So when you look at the dimension, two dimensions with the highest variation in your data and you plot them, you get a set of points. And what they have done here is so the set of points are obtained without looking at any labels. They just look at the uh, uh, genetic loci that have been characterized for all the samples and each dot is a sample. So the issue with normalization I think what, what he raised some types of clustering actually require you to normalize your data more strictly. You want all your proteins on the same scale. So in that case in addition to normalizing your samples you may need to normalize your proteins also. Otherwise your uh, distance calculations will be biased by proteins that have high ratios or high intensities. So again there you have to be a little more careful on uh, what kind of input the algorithm needs and how the algorithm works. The one uh, thing about uh, supervised learning is if you had three cancer types, let us say you had basal breast cancer, luminal A and luminal B breast cancer in your training data and then you give it a, a sample that is normal. So now it has never seen a sample that is normal and it knows only about three classes, basal, luminal A and luminal B. So it is going to try to force fit your sample into one of those three groups. So there is you the, the in most uh, uh, machine learning supervised models there is no way to say this does not belong in these classes. There is some other class I do not know about. There are some algorithms that do that but they are very complex and not easy to use and not commonly available. So most algorithms will not be able to say that this is a group they have not seen before. All they are going to do is take it and fit it into one of the groups that they have already seen. So in designing your um, uh, uh, training and uh, uh, setting up your analysis you want to keep that in mind. So you want to use all types of uh, labels in your training so that it can predict all types that you would encounter later on. So there are many ways for doing regression um, which is like predicting a continuous value. I will not go into the details but um, the most simple one is linear regression which is like fitting a straight line. So I am sure most of you have done this in high school or you, you have x and y values you want to find the line of best fit. So you can do that in more, uh, more dimensions than just two and th that is linear regression. Uh, linear regression is very noisy when you have lots and lots of uh, proteins and uh, not enough examples for each of those and so people have tried to make it more robust by using what is called regularization. So lasso and elastic nets are different ways to make linear regression more robust so that uh, it can handle noise better. So suppose you have 10,000 proteins you have observed and you try to predict cancer, uh, predict survival which is a real value. So for a, a patient you want to say how long they are going to live given that this is the profile you have in, in the proteome. So not all 10,000 genes or uh, proteins are useful in actually making the prediction. A lot of them are just noise and they do not change or not they are not related to making a prediction about survival. They are only a small subset that actually have any relation to survival. So but you do not know which ones they are. So you want to try to kind of build your model using things that are uh, relevant but leave out the others. So that is called feature selection and some of these other more robust methods. So in linear regression you, are, you have to give all the 10,000 and it will try to build a model and it will be very noisy because only let us say 100 out of the 10,000 actually have any information about predicting survival. But with these other methods it will automatically say uh, kind of filter out things that do not have any information and try to narrow down the number of features it uses to the most useful in order to make the prediction. So they end up being uh, more robust models uh, when you are looking at real data. So there are a lot of classification algorithms um, uh, for predicting groups. 
I won't go into each one of those. Uh, so K nearest neighbor is basically you, you pick a sample and you make your prediction based on looking at the samples that are closest to you. So you have seen cancer and normal samples. You get a new sample. You calculate the distance from this sample to all the samples you know. And then you see which are my three closest samples. And if my three closest samples are a cancer, then I say this is a cancer. If they are a normal, I say it's a normal. If they are half and half, I make a prediction based on majority with some probability saying, I think this is a cancer sample with probability 0.6, something like that. Classification trees result in models that you can understand because they say, if this protein is less than some value and this other protein is greater than some value, then it's a cancer. So it's a set of if then statements that will tell you which group to put it in. So they are very interpretable and people like it because they can see the model and understand what it's doing. The other ones many times you can't. Uh, random forests are a collection of trees. Uh, you all know that forest is a collection of trees. But these are random in the sense that they are built by making random subsamples of your data. So the result is a lot more robust than just a tree. So if it's built just one tree and there are quirks in your data that don't usually occur in your population, it will fit the model to the quirks and not be generalizable. So when you get a new sample, it will make a wrong prediction. So in order to avoid that, in random forests, you build a lot of trees with random changes so that the collection of trees is more robust than just a single tree. And when you make a prediction, you use all the trees to make the prediction. So I, I mentioned that models could be too specific or not specific enough. So the concept is called uh, generalization. So the basic hypothesis is that you learn a model using data and then your model is at the right level so that it's not too specific and not too general. And how you get there is basically by trying to avoid overfitting and uh, picking a model that has enough parameters to kind of fit the data you have. So it's a lot of uh, hand waving, but here's an example. So let's say you want to separate the green dots from the red dots. If you use a model that is too simple, that doesn't have enough parameters to tweak. So the linear, uh, uh, linear regression, a straight line, has only one thing you can tweak, which is the slope. So you can tweak the slope till you are blue in your face, but you can never separate the red dots from the green dots. So here the model is oversimplified. You have a model that's too simple to fit the data you have. If you had points that lied, uh, that were only in the top and the bottom, the red points were all here, and the green points were all here, a linear uh, line could separate those. But here your data is complex enough that you can't use a line to separate them. So what you can do, I can say, okay, I'm going to have a lot of parameters I can change. So I can uh, uh, draw an arbitrary line around my points. So that is this one. So now it's so specific to the green that if you get a new green that was right here next to the yellow, it's going to be outside the uh, uh, green points. And so it will make a wrong prediction. So this model is overfit. It, it is so specific to the small example you saw that it didn't capture what was happening in reality. This is a more correct model. This is basically like an ellipse. And so this has enough parameters to uh, overcome the restriction of this, but not too many so that you don't overfit. So the whole point in machine learning is to come up with models that are generalizable to new data without overfitting data that you uh, have in your data set. Your data set is an example with noise and uh, things that, are, that could not, uh, maybe only uh, specific to the data set. If you looked hard enough, you can find a lot of patterns. But only some of those patterns hold with everybody in the population. And some are just specific to the quirk that you have these 15 or 100 samples in your data set. And to avoid that, you want a model that is generalizable. So to do that when you are training, what you do is you take your data set, so you have 100 samples. You take a random subset of 25 samples and keep it aside. You use the remaining 75 samples chosen at random to build your model. And then every so often you use the test data set to say, how am I doing? 
Is my test data set getting good accuracy or is it poor accuracy? So what would happen is, as your model becomes more and more complex or you train your model more and more, your training error is going to drop because it's doing this. In cross-validation, what you do is you take your data set, you split it into five pieces, you learn on four pieces and predict on the fifth one, and then you keep cycling through. So you are using all your data to learn, and you are not keeping anything aside only for testing because you don't have enough data, but you are still getting an assessment of training and test error. This last slide is a summary of supervised and unsupervised machine learning methods. I'm sure you can't read it, but you can take a look at it on, on your computers. It's a reasonable collection of algorithms. Each one has its quirks. Each one is more appropriate in some situations than others. And you can uh, kind of take a look at it. So today we have learned that how machine learning applications and omics data analysis when taken into account can provide you the good biomarker candidates. Of course selecting a right biomarker depends on the what type of question you are looking for, what type of samples you have analyzed, what were the number of samples and which type of test you have used. After many of these careful considerations only you might be able to obtain a right candidate biomarker from your entire analysis. In today's lecture we have also heard that organization data into clusters shows the internal structure of the data. In linear regression and regularization section we also learnt about lasso and elastic nets. The elastic net is preferred as it is having no limitations in terms of selection of the number of variables. Finally we understood that we should avoid overfitting of data. In the flow of these lectures, Dr. Mani will talk to you about hypothesis testing in next lecture. Thank you.